Okay, so today we're going to be ranking the novels of the Bronte sisters. For those of you that have been on the channel for a while, you'll know that I love the Bronte sisters and they're some of my favourite writers and some of their books are my favourite books. So I decided to reread them all this autumn and winter to do this ranking video. I decided to stick with just the main novels of the Brontes, so I haven't looked at the poetry. I've only read Emily's poetry, so it felt kind of unfair to rank that when I haven't read the other two's poetry. So we're just going to stick with the novels. Although I will be including The Professor, which is a novel by Charlotte that wasn't published until after her death, but it is a book that's worth talking about, so I thought I would include it on the list. So here is my ranking of the Bronte novels worst to best. So the worst Bronte book in my opinion is Agnes Grey by Anne Bronte. This is the only Bronte book that I would say that I just don't really like this book much at all and I don't think it's a book that I will reread ever again. Agnes Grey tells the story of Agnes, a young woman who aspires to make a living for herself as a governess and so she goes off to be a governess and spends about 250 pages whinging about how horrible the families are that she is a governess for. This book was based on Anne's own experiences as a governess and in its time it caused quite a sensation because I think it opened up people's eyes to what a horrible job being a governess was. And that, you know, within the context of its time I will give credit where credit's due. I think this probably was a very interesting book for people to read. But I do think that of all the Bronte novels it's just one that doesn't really age very well because it's very much about this time, about being a governess and those things aren't very relatable now. Other problems with the book in my opinion are Agnes herself. I think that as a character she doesn't really develop or grow very much. She's presented right from the start of, as this kind of virtuous, holier-than-thou type of person who can do no wrong, while the children and their families who she's a governess for are just represented as evil, monstrous and cruel. And it's funny because Anne is usually seen as the realist Bronte sister. And I think with this book she just stretches believability a little bit too far because while I imagine the families of the people she worked for weren't the best, I doubt they were as monstrous as she presents here. And also Agnes probably as a human being has some flaws but we don't really touch on those in the story. Of all the sisters, Anne is probably the one who tries to push morals within her stories the most and Agnes Grey is the worst offender for this. Agnes, who is pure and virtuous, goes on and has a happy ending, whereas all of the nasty horrible people in the story get punished at some point. And this for me is not something I like. I don't really like that kind of obvious moralising in stories at all. But not to be completely negative about this book, one thing that I will say about this book, and also Anne in general, is that of all three Brontes, she is the easiest to read. And Agnes Grey is very easy to read and very accessible. Anne writes in a very engaging style that doesn't feel dated in terms of the writing style anyway. So if you're looking to get into the Brontes, Anne isn't a bad place to start. Although I would say maybe go with The Tenant of Whitehall Hall rather than Agnes Grey. So that's enough dumping on Agnes Grey. Let's move on and talk about some of the books that I prefer to that book. Next up we have a book that I really struggle to place, and that is Shirley by Charlotte Bronte. If Anne is the accessible Bronte sister, then Charlotte is definitely the least accessible Bronte sister. I find her writing style in all her books to be sometimes quite long-winded and laborious, and her books are the ones that tend to put me to sleep the most, even the ones that I think are fantastic. She just has a very dense prose style that's quite hard to read at times, and I think that Shirley is the worst book for this. But I will say some positives because I also think there's a lot going for this book and even though I've ranked it the lowest of Charlotte's books I do think it's very underrated and I do think it's definitely worth reading as well. First of all Shirley is just a fantastic character. I love that the novel is named after her but she doesn't even come into the novel for about 100 pages. She's also just a very strong-willed but also multifaceted character as well. She's she might even be my favourite of Charlotte's heroines. She's certainly up there and I think I might prefer her to Jane Eyre. The parts of the novel that focus on Shirley and her relationship with Catherine Hellstone are some of my favourite bits of the book and they're the bits that I think really excel in the novel. Unfortunately there is also a plot centred around uh, a mill and people protesting and doing violence and rioting because of the mill taking people's jobs and this part of the book I really didn't get on with as much. The kind of social novel aspects of it were quite long-winded, they weren't all that interesting and they don't really get a satisfying resolution either and the book just kind of jumps between this kind of more interpersonal relationship stuff with Shirley and this kind of social political stuff which I just don't think is done very well. So overall you get a bit of a mixed bag of a book and it's a very long book so you know it would have actually just been better to have condensed it and maybe put some of that social stuff to the background. Another thing that makes this book quite poignant is that it was written during the time when Charlotte lost both Emily and Anne and some people speculate that Catherine was actually inspired by Anne and that Shirley was inspired by Emily so that adds a nice sense of like poignancy to the whole book and makes it worth reading all the more. I don't know if that's true but 
It's certainly something that, from the research I've done about Anne's character and Emily's, they do definitely have similarities to these two characters. So if that is something that Charlotte was doing, then it does make this book very, very much worth engaging with. But overall, the issue with the book is that it can't really decide between these two things which one it wants to do. Does it want to do the social commentary stuff about the mill and the rebellion and all that, or does it want to kind of focus on this female friendship and their characters? And the fact that it kind of jumps between these two in a very jarring way just makes it kind of fall a bit flat. So that's why ultimately it's going to be number six for me. Next up we have The Professor, also by Charlotte Bronte. So The Professor tells a story of a young man who's from an aristocratic family and he decides he doesn't want to continue to be in the aristocratic family because if he does he'll have to marry one of his cousins who he doesn't like. And so he leaves that world and enters into the world of business with his brother and his brother doesn't like him because of his background and so ultimately he decides to make it out on his own as a teacher. And a romance ensues from there. What makes this a very interesting story within Charlotte's catalogue and also the Brontes more generally is that its sole focus is on a male protagonist and it's told from his point of view. And he's also a very interesting male protagonist and this is the reason why this book has beaten Shirley and Agnes Grey. One thing that I find as I read more and more books is that usually authors of one sex tend to struggle to write compelling characters of the other sex. And this can definitely be true in social novels where men tend to get represented as kind of, you know, evil patriarchal villains. But with The Professor we don't get that. We get a lot, wide range of masculinity being portrayed and it's very interesting. The protagonist himself is a shy, sensitive man with lots of anxieties about many things. He's not particularly attractive, he's reasonably smart, but you know, he's kind of an average Joe type. And this is quite similar to other characters from Charlotte's novels. She likes to pick women and men who are not, you know, these big beautiful uh, people who everyone loves. They're plain Jane, so to speak. And this is what really drew me to The Professor and what made it very compelling for me. I just wasn't expecting to get this kind of male character in a Bronte novel. I also think that Bronte is a little bit more subtle with her social commentary in this book. The position of the protagonist is that he's from this aristocratic family who don't fully accept him because he won't marry the woman that they want him to marry, which is interesting in and of itself and shows that the kind of historical tradition of forcing people to marry is bad for both men and women. And then he has to leave this world and go into the world of business with his brother, but his brother resents him because he's from an aristocratic background, so he kind of doesn't win in any area. And I just find it really interesting that Charlotte wanted to explore those issues and subtleties between different classes, not just the kind of bourgeois and the working class, but the business class, the aristocracy and the working class, everything. So it's just got a lot more to it in my opinion. Unfortunately though, The Professor as a whole is not the most compelling of stories. It just doesn't have the same panache or pizzazz as some of the better ones. While I do find the protagonist interesting and quite unique, especially as a male protagonist from this time period, I just didn't find him as engaging as, say, Jane Eyre, who has this great wit and sharp tongue. Also, the plot does sort of meander in places, and so ultimately it's not the most amazing book in the world, but it's definitely worth a read, especially if you're interested in seeing a more shy, sensitive man portrayed in a book. Okay, now we're on to number four, and perhaps somewhat controversially, I don't know, but we have Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte next. I don't know what it is about Charlotte's novels, but they always seem to just fluctuate massively every time I read them. I liked Wuthering Heights the first time I read it, I liked The Tent of Wildfell Hall the first time I read it, and I hated Agnes Grey the first time I read it. But with Charlotte's books, I just never know where I stand. The first time I read Jane Eyre, I enjoyed it, but I thought that overall it was not worth the hype. I really liked the early part of the novel where Jane's a child and she's going to the school and there's all that stuff going on, and then I liked the bit with Mr. Rochester a little bit, and then when she leaves Mr. Rochester and meets her long lost family, I just kind of checked out of the book. The second time that I read the book though, I found that I enjoyed pretty much the whole thing and Jane as a character just showed me sides to her that I didn't even know existed the first time around. And the same was also true of Mr. Rochester, who the first time I just saw as, as this kind of buffoonish bore, but actually it's quite a funny parody, but he's actually a quite entertaining parody of a tall, dark and handsome archetype. I can definitely see now why this is revered as a classic, because it's just a fantastic story. Jane is just a fantastic character who's struggling to assert her own identity in a world where everyone is trying to control her, from her aunt to her teachers to her potential love interests, and she is able to withstand this and stand up for herself. And that's a fantastic story. She also does this while still being quite vulnerable. She's not just some kind of cold, badass character. She has vulnerabilities, she has anxieties, and she has to overcome them. So she's not like Agnes Grey, who's just perfect and wonderful from start to finish. 
she's got depth and she's got complexity. And to be honest, her ultimate decision to be with Mr. Rochester is quite a controversial one because some might say that wasn't the right choice for her. So it's a very interesting end for that character because maybe for a lot of people they would expect her to just reject marriage altogether, but she doesn't, she accepts it in the end. The only thing that keeps Jane Eyre from reaching the kind of top three is that I do think that Charlotte does not a very good job of blending the gothic elements and atmosphere to the story with the kind of social realism that she's going for. There are just some really silly scenes that are semi-supernatural, like when Jane and Mr. Rochester seem to have a psychic connection that makes Jane then go back to Mr. Rochester because she senses he's in danger, or the part of the book where Mr. Rochester dresses up as a gypsy in disguise. It's, I mean, I do find that a little bit funny, but at the same time, it's also slightly ridiculous and, you know, stretches the bounds of believability. And that's to say nothing about Jane leaving Mr. Rochester's and just finding her way to her long-lost family, just by coincidence. Now, coincidences are definitely a thing, especially in older texts. I don't know what it is, but there are lots of coincidences in them. I guess the world was just a lot smaller back then, so maybe it was just more likely that you would just bump into long-lost family, because they would probably live close by anyway. But it still stretches the realms of believability a little bit. And so for these reasons, that's why I'm going to kind of keep Jane Eyre off the top three. And now onto the top three, and this was very difficult because before I read the books for the second time, I had a sense of where I was going to go with this. And then I read them again and then changed my mind and changed my mind and changed my mind. But I think the order that I've settled on now is not necessarily definitive, but I'm reasonably confident in it to say it in this video and have a discussion about it with you in the comments. In any case, what I will say is that each of these books gets five stars from me. I think they're fantastic books, I think they're definitely worth reading and then rereading, and they have a lot to offer. So even if your favourite doesn't come out on top, they're all still great books and definitely worth a read. In third place we have The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte. So this is probably the most feminist of all the Bronte books. It tells the story of a young woman who falls into a very abusive marriage and she has to struggle in this marriage, eventually try and escape it, and then make a living for herself, dealing with society's expectations of her as a woman who's now trying to make her own career, having run away from her husband. Anne is definitely the least romantic of the Bronte sisters. All of, both of her books have this kind of gritty realist approach to them, where they really don't, you know, portray any kind of romantic hero types that are rugged and dashing and dangerous. Anne is a lot more realist about these kinds of men, and she's also very critical of these kinds of men. Now this does mean that the book lacks in gothic atmosphere with a couple of exceptions. I really like the early parts of the book, which are set in this rural town, and you just get this really pastoral setting, which is really nice. And also Wildfell Hall has this very gothic, atmospheric feel to it as well. So Anne does have those romantic tendencies, and sometimes she indulges in them a little bit, but it's not as brooding and foreboding as the likes of Wuthering Heights, that's for sure. But what you do get from the tenant of Wildfell Hall is you get some very compelling, very interesting characters. First of all, let's look at Helen and compare her to Agnes Grey. Helen, unlike Agnes, is a character who makes mistakes. It's actually Helen that chooses to marry her husband, Mr. Huntington. So she's not just kind of thrown passively into a situation and then whinging about it. She chooses a situation by being deceived by this charming man, and then she slowly realises that he's terrible. And throughout the course of the story, she really does have this struggle because on the one hand, she really wants to love him, and for a while she still does, even when he's doing horrible things. But on the other hand, she also wants to fix him, and she can't because he doesn't want to listen to her. And so you slowly just get this nice development as she falls out of love with him, and then tries to escape him and protect her son from him and his influence. And I found this to be really well done. It was very meticulous and it was very slow, which I liked. It wasn't just like she wakes up one day and she realises he's horrible and now she gets away. It took her a long time to actually get over her husband. And she even ends up, you know, helping him towards the end of the story when you think that she might just run away. So she's a very interesting and very complex character. Light years better than Agnes Grey, in my opinion. Even Mr. Huntington, who I do think can be a little bit of a parody sometimes, does have a bit of complexity to him as well. I also liked his friends because they kind of sit somewhere between the extreme decadence of Mr. Huntington and being virtuous. And some of them have their own mini character arcs as well, going from less good people to slightly better people, or in some cases becoming worse people. So I just found that really interesting and a lot more complex than what Anne did in Agnes Grey. Ultimately though, there are two reasons why The Tenant of Wavell Hall was kept out of the top two spots. Firstly, I just think the atmosphere of the other two books on this list are just so perfect, and I love a story that can create an atmosphere. And The Tenant of Wavell Hall, while it does have atmosphere in places, 
In general it doesn't because it's not going for that sort of romantic brooding atmosphere anyway. So for personal preference, I'm just not preferring this as much for that reason. Secondly, while I do think that the main characters have a little bit more depth and some of the secondary characters do too, Anne does still do the moralising thing that I don't like. At the end of the story you basically just get this sort of contrived moment where the narrator tells you about how all of the horrible people in the book who stay horrible have terrible fates and suffer and die and you know the good characters get to live on happily and it's wonderful. And again, I just think it's a little bit heavy handed and I don't think it was needed really. In fact it would just be better to have gone with the more realist tone of the whole story and say well some of them suffered for their sins, some of them are still out there doing terrible things but Helen managed to escape and that's ultimately all that matters in the story. So for those two reasons, lack of atmosphere, a little bit of moralising, that's why it's not going to be in the top two for me. So at number two is the book that I would say is the most difficult Bronte novel and that is Villette by Charlotte Bronte. Now despite the fact that I didn't like Agnes Grey, it's Villette that's the only Bronte book that I actually struggled to finish and when I first read it I put it down after about 50 pages and thought nope this isn't for me and then changed my mind and went back, read the whole thing and found it to be very difficult but very rewarding. Lucy Snow is a young shy woman who leaves England after losing her family, or it's implied that she loses her family, in a tragic accident. She leaves England to go to France to make a living as a teacher in a fictional town called Villette. Now if this sounds a little bit familiar it's because the basic plot of this was actually lifted from The Professor, although it really is just the basic plot in that you have a character who's quite anxious and shy and they go somewhere else and try and make a living there. Otherwise it's quite a different book, so don't think these two things are just the same story, one told from a male perspective and one from a female, because they're definitely very different from each other. Now Villette paints such a complex picture of the human mind that some people argue that it's foreshadowing the modernist writers like Proust, James Joyce and Virginia Woolf with their stream of consciousness style of writing. Now this is especially true at the end of the book where Lucy ends up taking some drugs by accident and has a hallucination which comes out of nowhere but is fantastically written in one of the most interesting scenes that Charlotte Bronte ever put to page. But I'm definitely not going to lie, this is a hard book to read. Charlotte Bronte, as I've already said, is just a very difficult writer. She can be really verbose and complex sometimes and Lucy Snow as a character is not the most likeable of protagonists. Not because she's horrible or anything, it's just that she tends to be quite uh, abstract, she tends to be quite cerebral and she even teases the reader. She sometimes withholds information deliberately, sometimes not telling you who her character is until it suits dramatic purpose for her to do so and she's constantly toying with the reader and teasing the reader. So she's, while she's quite shy, she's also got this kind of dark sense of humour and it makes her kind of unsettling because you don't feel like you can quite pin this person down. They're very strange, um, which you know makes for a very fascinating character, but also not the most likeable character in the world either. What I also like about Lucy Snow is that unlike say Jane who is quite vocal about her strength, Lucy is quite introverted, she's a very shy person and outwardly people think she's basically just a pushover, but inwardly she has this iron will and also quite a snarky wit sometimes. So you have this very rich inner life contrasted with this sort of passive outer life, which I just find really interesting and as someone who can be quite introverted myself, I can relate to that a lot because just because I'm quiet out there it doesn't mean that I'm quiet in here. And ultimately that's why the book's coming out so high, because I just think that even though it's hard and even though you may find like me that you want to put it down sometimes, it's really worth reading and once you've got through it once it's definitely easier to get through it again. So don't be put off by this one if you find it quite difficult because I think it's just one of those books that takes time and takes a few rereads to really get what's going on. And what's going on is just a fantastic rich tapestry of a character. Now what keeps this book back though is again two things. One, I do think it's a little bit too long. This is probably a criticism that I would give to most of Charlotte's books. I think most of them could just be a little bit shorter. And also she does try and do the whole ghost supernatural thing again in a very contrived way and I'm not a fan of that and I think it's just, she just needs to stop <laughs> trying to bring in this sort of supernatural stuff into what are otherwise quite realist stories because it just, it doesn't work, especially when you, you try and explain logically the supernatural stuff because then things just seem really contrived. So for those two reasons it's off the top spot. And so that leaves only one book and if you're familiar with the Brontes you'll know which book it is because it's Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte, the only book sadly that she ever wrote. While I was reading Villette and while I was reading The Tenet of Whitewell Hall I did genuinely think that they could have beaten Wuthering Heights and then I went read Wuthering Heights and it was just a matter of no contest. 
this is still just one of my favourite books. It's just a classic tale of vengeful love, of very dark passion, and of ultimately of forgiveness. And it's just got some of the most complex, hilarious, and dramatic characters. Heathcliff is just a wonderful, bionic hero type, and while some say that Emily romanticises him, I feel like that's more a product of how he's presented in media and film especially, because they tend to kind of focus on the romance of Catherine and Heathcliff and present it as a class romance, which to some extent it does have a class element in it, but it's also a tale of two pretty narcissistic, horrible people doing terrible things to each other. and. There's also people around them who do terrible things as well. Heathcliff is just a wonderful, morally complex anti-hero. He has a tragic backstory that makes you feel bad for him, but then he turns into a monster so you feel no pity for him, and then he sort of has a redemption at the end, but it's kind of ambiguous, and you know, you're not, still not really quite sure how you feel about him when the story finishes. And then you have Catherine, who has such a strong presence and personality that even after she's gone from the novel after the first half, she's still very much present for the rest of the story, even sometimes more present than some of the other characters that are there. I just love the relationship between these two, and one thing that I found, especially this time that I read it, was just how hilarious it is. Kind of like with Jane Eyre, when I read it the first time I took it a lot more seriously, but having read both books a few times, I'm just able to appreciate how much of it feels like parody sometimes. Especially in Wuthering Heights, because pretty much everyone has a very big personality, and sometimes watching those personalities clash is hilarious, and sometimes it can be quite scary too. I also like that pretty much every character has some kind of flaw, and none of them are presented in such an evil, corrupt way that you don't feel some pity for them, at least at some point in the story. Which can be quite a hard thing to do, especially when you've got characters in a book like this where they are mostly doing terrible things. Also, I think that Wuthering Heights does what no other Bronte book does as well, which is imbue the story with this persistent, gothic atmosphere that has this undercurrent of supernatural stuff going on, but also leaves things ambiguous enough that the supernatural stuff doesn't feel out of place, or contrived, or weird. Take Kathy's ghost. It's perfectly consistent with the story that this is just a hallucination of a man who's freezing cold and a little bit scared because he's in a very weird house. Or it could be an actual ghost. Then you have Heathcliff's death, which seems like it might have some kind of supernatural element to it, but also you just don't quite know. And I love that. I think that the way that Emily sets up these things just works, especially with the ghost, because she spends a lot of effort making it really seem like this could just be a dream of someone who's gone a bit loopy. But she also leaves it open for the other explanation, so it doesn't feel contrived and it's ambiguous, which I think just works really well. Overall, it's just a fantastic book. The one, the one negative that I would say is that Catherine's death does leave a little bit of a hole in the book, and the second part is a lot harder to get on with than the first, because once she's gone from it, a lot of the main tension that drove the first book, i.e. the relationship between her and Heathcliff, and also Edgar, is gone. So that does kind of change the book a lot, but on rereads I've actually found that the second part of the book is equally good as the first book. There's a lot going on there, and it's interesting to see how the same cycles of revenge might repeat themselves in future generations. So even though I do find that Catherine's death does change the book a little bit, I do think that it's not something that damages the book all that much. Alright, that's it for my ranking of the Bronte novels. Let me know in the comments how would you would rank the books that you've read, or all the books if you've read them all. I look forward to talking with you about these books in the comments, and please don't go crazy. Remember this is just a fun video where I'm giving my opinions, and I'd also like very much to hear yours, so if you've got some, let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to the channel. But that is it for this video, so take care everyone. Ta-ra!